and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, and I think you'll be shocked to learn that Neo is just an anagram of one, and mobile is just an anagram of limbo. And I'm Matt Freeman, and I'm here to tell you that Agent Smith is just an anagram of this movie makes no goddamn sense. <laughs> That's right, Matt. This week on the show, we are finally continuing our multi-part deconstructing director series where we analyze the films of Lily and Lana Wachowski. It's the fourth movie in this marathon and the final film in the Matrix trilogy. This week, we're talking about the Matrix revolutions. And uh, I think it's going to be a interesting if if depressing conversation it, it is and and maybe we should contextualize as usual that the reason we wanted to do this was we think that they're great filmmakers and we wanted to revisit these movies and try to understand number one are they as bad as we remember them and as everyone says uh or are we missing something were we missing something when we saw them when we were younger and um well we'll we'll get into all that i guess yeah, we will have lots to say about that. Um, then we're going to finish up the show where I'm going to talk about a new Amazon show called Homecoming that I've seen about half the episodes for. And I just wanted to kind of bring it here and bring it to you because it is a show based on a audio narrative podcast. So I thought that was kind of something that's right up our alley and might be fun to talk about for a little bit. Um, and I think that's all we got for this week. It's going to be a, a sh I say short, this is, this matrix conversation is probably going to go on for a while. Yeah. Um, I guess we, we, we've, we've talked about this a lot already, but, uh, I think there's no shortage of things to say actually. No, so. there's not. So let's just go ahead and do it. Let's jump right into it and let's talk about the matrix revolutions. In less than 12 hours, the machines will breach the dock walls. If we have to give our lives, we give them hell before we do! Can Zion be saved? Tonight, the future of both worlds will be in your hands. Or in his. Mr. Anderson, welcome back. We missed you. It ends tonight. So, Matt, I had a dream. Mm -hmm. um, I had a dream when we started this series that I was going to get to The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions, and I was going to realize that I was wrong and that these movies are actually better than we remember them and they're actually good movies and, and uh, the, the disappointment in the film was the movies trying to do something different than the original one did and people didn't like that and they rejected it. That is what I was hoping was going to happen. Matt, that's not what happened. No. Um, I, I think we, we talked a lot about Reloaded and, and how there are parts of that movie I liked, um, but it was overall disappointment. And this is just I, this is just, I think, a bad movie. Like, I, I don't I, I'm not even going to sugarcoat it like and say there, there are parts of this movie that I enjoy, but I think this is just a bad movie. Yeah, I think what I had to say about about Reloaded was that I, I wanted to give it actually a few points because the quote unquote boring philosophy diatribes actually made sense on, on reflection and, and with like some age and kind of extending the movie some generosity as to what it might be trying to say. Um, none of the conversations in this movie make any sense. It all feels like a rushed kind of like writing patch job where they're like, we have to get to the end so just fill in scenes and um nothing works dramatically <laughs> or in terms of character or uh even action wise uh i guess there may be maybe one or two things that that work action wise and i think we can give it its due um where, where it does work but it's yeah it, it doesn't and so, so my, my whole like theory behind why this is, and maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, is that they had a lot of time to work on the Matrix script. They, they probably polished it and revised it and made many iterations to get it to the point where they could make a movie. And then they were handed a bank full of money and told to make two more of these movies. And they did their best, 
but uh, th- it really shows the, the, the lack of polish, the fact that they didn't intend on making these movies in the first place, um, just the incoherence and yeah, all of the yeah. problems stem from that fact. I think, I think this is why all of the other movies are either good or great. And the, and, and this, and, and uh, these, the, these latter two matrix movies got progressively worse. Yeah. And I, I pretty much agree with that. Um, I was hoping to be able to determine whether or not after watching these two movies and thinking about them for as long as we have, um, if if it was clear to me that they were never planning on making these sequels. And I think I think I got my wish there. Um, Mm -hmm. It is clear to me that these were never in the plan from the beginning. If you look at a lot of the elements of these movies that they take from the first one, it is building off of something in a way that they didn't think they were going to have to. Like if you look at the whole Agent Smith thing, there is there is no part of me that thinks that they had any kind of idea to make agent Smith into the character he becomes in this movie. Um, he was just supposed to be a, a stand in for the, the, the system that Neo defeats at the end and kills and wins. And that was going to be the end of it. And then they decided to do something with him. And I think the problems stem there because it's kind of like fitting him into a thing he never met. Like a lot of my issues with this movie and the one before it is that it's not that it contradicts stuff from the first one. It's just that it doesn't flow as nice. And I think, I think that is to your, to what you said about how they had so much time with that first script. It's a, it's a tight script that they spent a lot of time on. And like the philosophy stuff is there, but it like integrates with the themes and like, it's, it's not like just kind of tacked on. Like it doesn't feel like we just go from action scene to philosophical discussion to action scene to philosophical discussion. And that's what, reloaded did and that's what revolutions does even more yeah absolutely to take smith as an example he really is an iconic villain in the first movie he's a, he's a fantastic character um and he has a very like you can explain exactly what his deal is like he basically hates humans resents being trapped in the matrix and specifically wants to destroy zion so that he won't have to be in the matrix anymore that's that's what he wants that's it's right. ve- very clear. He no longer wants any of those things in this movie or in, in the latter two movies. He becomes a completely different person who just wants to kill Neo specifically, doesn't really care much about um, Zion, and in fact doesn't appear to want to leave the Matrix. He just wants to like take it over, which I guess you could say is similar because yeah. then he can reshape it the way he wants, but it doesn't <laughs> doesn't connect, right? It doesn't... F- it just it just seems like he's a new character and and he's not well i mean he's not scary anymore for one thing yeah. there's there's a million of him and thus his like value as a villain is is reduced but you we have to say to give the movie credit hugo weaving is having a great time playing this character especially in this movie he goes yeah. full ham and is enjoying every minute of it and i think it works to a certain extent like it works in the the frame of these movies are are silly and over the top which which it, the first one was not for sure but that's what that's what this movie is it's kind of a silly over the top science fiction story i agree completely in fact i think his performance in this movie um is one of the brighter spots in, in the in the movie um i don't think he'd realized in the second movie that he needed to be more insane yeah but like the stuff where he picks up the platter of cookies and throws it at the wall <laughs> oh, and it's so good that yeah that, that whole that whole bit and um let, let, yeah full ham like you said that, that's 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 the fun part and the fact that he's having so much fun you're, you're like oh i i'm feeling something yeah <laughs> while exactly. watching the movie which is which is good but the, i mean but then when you start to inspect it, like when you really start to dive into this movie, the movie falls apart. And I think I think we realized that as we were kind of chatting about it today in preparation for the show, that any time we ask a question that goes any amount of uh, space under the surface, everything just kind of stops making sense. Yeah. And I don't even know if I could summarize this movie if I wanted to to because like i am so unclear on everyone's motivations like smith tells you what his motivation is smith like he's a character i don't really understand and i mean i mean in the this the in this movie in particular not yeah i think like you said he is he's very much a simple understandable character in the first one but he he gives the speech about um in the second movie he gives a speech about purpose and and how he his purpose was taken from him and he found a new one and 
And then he's talking in this speech about like his purposes, that the purpose of he found out the purpose of life is to end, which really doesn't make sense. Like there's there's a lot of stuff in this movie, a, a lot of like lip service paid to these uh, these ideas of purpose and belief and choice. And it's the same kind of stuff that was really in the in the first one, but almost even more so um, because this is coming to the culmination of all these ideas. And and in my mind, the culmination of all these ideas is nothing like yeah. I, I don't. I, we really tried to, to break down this movie in a way that just like to break it down to its to just its scaffolding and try to find out what it is doing. Yeah. And, and I've, we spent like days thinking and talking <laughs> yes, about this at yes. this point. Like there are certain things that I feel like I can steal, man. Uh, like the idea of choice, like after really thinking about it, I was like, okay, maybe they're trying to say something about like the machines, whether it be the architect or the Oracle or, or whoever they can, they can see the future, predict the future, control the future, except where, um, either human choice or maybe even human and machine choice are involved because there's an element of free will and maybe the Wachowskis are trying to front some kind of, um, you know, fundamental, um, as it's, as it's called libertarian free will, where, where, where the, the agent can choose whatever they, whatever they want. They're not constrained by physics. Or you just say that the, the predictive powers of the AIs is not sufficient to be able to predict, predict the choice, w whatever, fine. <laughs> but um, they don't really do much with it other than say like uh, the, the Oracle can't see past a certain point because of the, some choice that she made and the architect can't um, get the matrix to work the way he wants because of the element of human choice. Um, and it's like, okay, that's, um, that that's fine. Like, yeah, but it's uh, just, it's kind of shallow, right? Like the idea that yeah. like, we all have a choice. Yeah. It's not really profound. Right. That's, I mean, I hesitate to use the word sophomoric, but that is one that keeps coming up in my thinking where I'm like, um, you didn't really do much with this idea. Like, it's certainly not mind blowing. Like th yeah. that's the thing is you keep digging, hoping that, hoping that you'll get it and then it'll become really, um, impactful. Right. You know, and it's, it never, it never does. Cause it's not, it's not, uh, it's not deep and it's not complicated. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, like, I feel like in the first movie, these things were so clear, right? Like the movie itself is, is, is kind of, um, abstract in a way, but the, but the central metaphor behind it is clear that the matrix represents this power structure. And these are people trying to break free from societal power structures and, and find their own voice, find their own identity, find who they are. That is clear and makes sense. And then as we've introduced these new philosophical philosophical things into it it's muddied it to the point where the matrix as a symbol doesn't make sense anymore and and that that's i i, I think that's why the movie this movie spends so little time in the matrix because this movie is, is barely in the matrix we have a scene at the very beginning and a scene at the very end and then the an hour and like 10 minutes of this movie is uh the battle of zion um and it just it, none of it is clear to me anymore. And it, it's not like abstract in a like a fascinating way where I like want to pick it apart and be like, oh, man, what do, what is my interpretation of what this movie is saying? It's just it's just you're just sit there, sitting there going like, wait, well, who's doing what they want? Who? What? Why? And it just it, it's nonsense. It's and I think a mess. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we've kind of done over the course of the show is is compare the Oracle conversations, because each of these three movies has a five minute conversation with the Oracle. And you can see the train of nonsense from the first one to the second one to this final one, which um, I watched it in the movie. And then I went back today in preparation to do the show and watched it two more times from beginning to end to see if I could make some sense of what the hell they're talking about in this mm -hmm. conversation. And I, I, I can't, I, I just, I just can't. Um, 
the Oracle, this is a different Oracle now because the actress who, who played her sadly passed away. So they kind of wrote some stuff into the story, like they paid some lip service to the idea that um, because of a choice she made at the end of the second one, which is left kind of ambiguous and we're not sure what it is, um, she was attacked and killed and then she's the oracle she can't die so she just reformatted but she doesn't get to keep all of herself so she looks different um which is fine i understand they had to do that because they lost the actress and that's not their fault um but she just she's not saying anything that actually makes any sense in this movie yeah yeah um not only so as you say when you dig into the conversation and you and you listen to it a couple times it doesn't make sense but like the writing itself is just atrociously bad where they're just like these loops of like and then what does that mean you already know the answer to that it's like okay no <laughs> like that's not that, but I, I don't, don't know what like like we yeah we don't i don't understand what what's what am i okay and this is like my overriding um point about this whole movie and much of the last one actually is i never know what i'm supposed to be feeling and yeah. I don't even mean to say I'm not feeling the right feelings. I mean, I literally don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling. And and the number one example of that I'll, I'll point out is the is the Agent Smith Dragon Ball Z fight at the end <laughs> where um, I just I don't I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling because Trinity has just died, yeah. which is very, it's very sad. I, I think you actually do feel sad about that, um, or at least I think I did the first time I saw the movie when I was younger. And then we're immediately going to like a, a, a bitch and rad Dragon Ball Z fight with punching and explosions. And it goes on for like three times longer than you're kind of emotionally like able to, to, to be involved with. Yeah. Um, Cause it's like they punch each other and they just fly in different directions and then they rally themselves. And then that happens again. And then that happens again. Yeah, I mean, it's literally it's literally the same problem with Dragon Ball Z. The show is that it's just not emotionally engaging type of combat at all. Yeah, just I mean, for the simple reason that no matter how hard they hit each other, you don't actually see any evidence of damage. And and unless you're like, okay, what what was the point here? And I mean, the the movie to its to its credit, like recognizes that the battle can't like actually be won or lost in that fashion, which is why Neo makes it you know decides to sacrifice himself which is actually the the only winning move yeah um but it took them way too long to get there to the point where by the time you're there you're like just kind of tired and bored well and and it's a problem of i i hate saying this because i i complain about this so much but i think it's a problem of stakes because Mm -hmm. i think it's okay for a character to realize that the only way to win is to lose but that retroactively makes everything that just happened pointless because it means that if if he can't win, which he can't, then we didn't need the battle to go on for tw- 20 minutes. Yeah. We just like, it just, it, it, we didn't need it. We like, I, I, I agree that the realization can work and there's an emotional attachment to the idea that, Oh, I've just come to the realization that, that everything has to end, including me. I have to do this. I have to, um, recontact the source or some nebulous stuff that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, yeah. um, that makes sense. But it just means that like, yeah, all the kicking and punching and explosions, it just, it, it was not in service to anything because if, if he had just lost that fight, he would have won. Yeah. Even the, you know, the, the freeway fight in the previous movie, um, it had stakes because you're following characters who are mo- more vulnerable and they have an objective, which is to protect right. this, this dude who like has no combat abilities anyway. And, and, and it's complex. Things are changing. The situation is evolving. So even though the freeway chase is pretty long and in my opinion, like does become exhausting eventually, um, it's, it's more exhausting because, uh, you just can't remain tense for yeah. like 30 minutes consecutively. So you just kind of like, are just like, okay, I, I'm I, whatever, just r- wrap it up. Um, yeah. th- this movie, you're not even tense. Like you're, cause you don't care. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, people complain that the second movie was just a fetch quest, which they're right, but at least in a fetch quest, you, you know what your characters are going for. Yeah. You, you know what they're trying to do and it, it be trying to layer in this philosophy on top of of the events that are happening in this movie, all it does is confuse the motives of every single one of your characters. Like, Neo, you know what you're going to have to do, but 
but does he like and if he does, he doesn't tell us. And that's I mean, I think that's what we get down to is all of this philosophy, all of these conversations, all of this complex thing in this movie is just people talking about the ideas. It's never the movie showing the ideas. There's this conversation in the beginning of the movie between Neo and um, I forget the guy's name, but he's talking. He's he's one of the guys that's bringing his daughter to the Matrix because his daughter is a program that has no purpose. And mm-hmm. he's talking about belief and this idea of uh, like karma and, and believing in things just because you're choosing to believe in them. And that's great, but that's just people talking about ideas. That's not a movie exploring those ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and maybe it's trying to, but just failing. Because, I mean, you could like squint and say like, well, he he does determine that he's going to fulfill his destiny as the savior at the cost of his own life. Um, but I, you don't feel the dramatic connection between those things. I mean, it's a subtle thing that we're, that we're talking about here, like the way in which every element of the matrix, the first film um, is aligned to, to make you both understand and feel what, what, like the, the theme of, you know, of, of finding your true identity and embracing it, both, both the plot and, and the drama and, you know, the, the concepts and the conversations and everything are equally aligned toward making you understand and feel that. While in this movie, those those elements might all kind of be in there, but they're not aligned and they're not connected and they're not conveyed. And so in a sense, I almost I, I feel like if they had, you know, uh, five years or whatever to work on these scripts, they could have made this work and the movie would be different, obviously. Yeah. But but like we, we would instead be talking about all of these themes that, that were mentioned in the conversations, except we would be talking about how awesome it was because of how well <laughs> they, they connected to us. Right. And that's, I think that's the most frustrating thing about this experience was, is I can see the good, fascinating story underneath all this. And I know these women are, are smart enough, talented enough filmmakers to, to, you know, mold that idea into something amazing. Um, and they just didn't get the opportunity to, and it, it's, it's disappointing and, and I, I, it's understandable, but it just bums me out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about the stuff that did work a little bit. Yeah. Let's, let's do, let's, let's, uh, reverse compliment sandwich it and talk right. about the stuff we did. Like, um, we talked about Hugo weaving already. I, I want to talk about the Zion battle a little bit because yeah. as much as it ultimately doesn't really matter. I actually think the sequence, as long as it is, is well constructed. I, I think it's very non matrixy and it doesn't feel like we're in a Matrix movie anymore because it's, it's, a, it's a kind of action that's completely different from the action um, in, in the rest of these movies. But I think like the set piece has clearly defined characters like we have. We have all of our different characters in this. We got the guy in the mech. We've got the general. We've got the kid that Neo saved. We've got the two women that um, they're doing the um, the rocket, the, thing. the rockets. Yeah. And so we've got some clear objectives here and we've got different characters. We're seeing the battle from different angles. Like, I think it cuts back to it. It, it doesn't stay with it for too long. Um, I, I think the visuals of like the swarming squids are actually pretty impressive, even though it makes no logical sense for a machine to behave that way. But um, that's besides the point. Um, I, I think I think there's a lot of emotion and stakes behind this. I also like the idea of um, Morpheus and uh, what's what's a. Jada Pinkett Smith's character's Niobe. name. Niobe. Thank you. I like their them racing through the the tunnel that only she can pilot to get back and save the team in time. Like I think all of that is constructed very well. It just it just is almost taking place inside a different movie because it doesn't matter to the central plot of this story. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm not going. I'm not even going to rag on it that much because while it's true that it ends up being like quite tangential. Um, it still actually connects dramatically. I think, like you, even though it it doesn't matter that the guy in the mech like basically dies for no reason, and you aren't really sure why they're really fighting. Because I mean, ultimately they're fighting to to uh, save time while Neo while Neo fights Smith, right? Yeah. So like you could argue that they saved lives just by delaying the machines, which is something 
and I guess, yeah, like I, I, I'll talk about, yeah, I mean, I agree with you that the, the visuals were actually amazing. When I was watching it this, this recent time for the rewatch, I was, um, I don't know if stunned is an appropriately, maybe too strong a word, but the, the scenes where like all of the squids have come in and they form into like the giant clumped mass that's like slinking around and just like taking the bullets, um, and and the music is is like really loud and and kind of aggressive. Yeah, I was like, wow, this this is this is excellent. This is awesome. Um, this is even me making this is even making me feel what I'm what I'm pretty sure they're trying to make me feel. Yeah, in, ter- in terms of like the awe and and um, intimidation of this of this force and, and the hopelessness of the situation and all of that. It, it, that, that all works really well. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I I feel like I feel like maybe they were like. Um, trying to make this into the heart of the movie but because it does I, th- I think the Zion stuff does work fairly well it didn't work to, for me in, in the previous movie but the Zion stuff works fairly well for me in this movie yeah I mean because it's it's relatable characters with understandable stakes and you know you know what their goal is you know what the risks are all that is very clear while at the same time you have Neo over here who's just like I need to do this and I mean, like we talked about last time, I think one of the things that this movie realized is it doesn't know what to do with Neo. So it kind of relegates Neo to the background. Like the first half an hour of the movie, Neo stuck in limbo because it doesn't know what to do with him. So it just literally pockets him to the side while the other characters are doing stuff. Then it frees him and then he does nothing for a long time until until finally at the end, he he falls into the savior role, um, which seems like was always going to be the cho- like it doesn't feel like a choice to me. That's that's the weird thing about this. This is a movie about choice and his choice in it seems so dramatically inert. Meanwhile, everyone fighting in Zion is making a choice to fight against a force that will kill them, that is designed to kill them and they're going to lose. But they choose to continue fighting anyway. And I think that's how it dramatically ties to Mm. the smith fight but it's just so much more satisfying when it's not god people flying through the air punching each other and we see slow-mo rain jobs hitting fists yeah i don't i honestly don't even see how it's a choice like i thought even the first time i saw this when i was young i thought it was extremely like vacuous and just fell completely flat when when smith is like why do you keep fighting? Why do you persist and it's a wonderful wonderfully delivered hugo weaving line and his response is because I choose to. It's like, well, that's that's utterly like insipid yeah. and, and, and and vacuous. It's like, it's like, why why what he's asking is why do you choose to? <laughs> that's what he's asking. Yeah, you're not really answering the question, <laughs> right? Like, that's not that's, that the way. Let me explain this to you, Neo. The way minds work is you have a reason to do something, and if that reason is compelling, then you choose to do that thing. Uh, yeah, I almost think it would have been a better answer said because I believe in something, which fits the entire conversation he had with the guy in limbo. Right. Like, uh-huh. like, I, I, like, I think the, the movie's like waffling between whether it's talking about belief or choice and it, it doesn't seem to want to commit. I, I don't know. I, like, it's so it's so confusing <laughs> to me. Yeah. And that, another I mean, see, that that's the thing. And this is not even me arguing with the movie. It's more me arguing with like the philosophy and the incoherence of it and saying like, you don't actually choose to believe things. You believe things when, when like you have sufficient evidence to make an expectation that that thing is going to come to pass. So like if, if I tell you, uh, Scott, I have the ability to like snap my fingers and make a big pile of money appear next to you right now. <laughs> like you, you, you don't believe me, right? Like, you, yeah, like, no. like you can't make yourself believe me. And, and yeah, it's yeah, in, no, no, didn't work. Didn't work. So, so, so the point is, you don't choose to believe things, and when you believe things, it's because you have a reason to, and you also don't make choices that aren't for reasons. So, like, none of the philosophy makes any sense, even. Like, I really, I, I've, I've thought about it. I've spent a few days, ever <laughs> since we watched the first, uh, the first one of these, or pretty much the whole time we've been doing this, I've been thinking, yeah. like, what, what, what is the, I mean, this isn't that complicated like th- these are not these are not unsolved problems in philosophy this is pretty right. straightforward like reasoning and i'm just like i don't i don't understand what, what. <laughs> yeah 
don't yeah. Know. And I think, you know, you know what I think, you know what I think this all goes, goes back to and, and the biggest bone I have to pick with this movie, we kind of bent over backwards in our discussion of Reloaded to talk about how much we loved the idea of taking the prophecy and basically turning on it on its head uh-huh. and saying, no, actually, that whole thing, that whole belief system that you put your faith into was bullshit. It wasn't real. Deal with that. Mm-hmm. And then this third movie goes, just kidding. <laughs> it's actually no, it's to- it's legit because he can he can kill things in the real world with his mind. Um, he's a he's a savior. Yeah, just kidding. And I just think like it it completely undermines the all the dramatic potential they had in that second movie. Like there's so much potential around the idea of exploring what, what a, who a Morpheus is after he has been stripped of the very thing he believes in. What is this person going to do now? The machines are coming. The thing that you thought was going to save you isn't real. You were wrong. What do you do now? And, and what the movie does is say, actually, we're going to, immediately after that give neo superpowers so he goes right back into believing him again so the morpheus at the end of this movie is the same person he hasn't changed at all he he's he's still blindly believing in this thing that turned out to be true yeah imagine how potentially much better this could be if the resolution of the franchise did not involve like a cliched heroic sacrifice like like even if it was just something at like um a a a, a clever like a clever um negotiation or deal made by some character who isn't neo maybe isn't even one of the main cast you know like niobe makes some clever choice and and it's like it's like yeah we like like isn't that a better subversion i mean maybe it's not i don't know it's hard, hard. I'm asking, I'm asking the imagination to do a lot of heavy lifting here, but but the point is, it it as you say it in the second movie, it's like aha, we're we're a clever subversion of the of the of the savior and the hero uh, uh, archetype, and then it just is like no, actually, it's still exactly the same thing. Yeah, and and I think there's a a way to tell that story, right? Like there's a way to say actually the thing that you believed in is just another method of control and then for the movie to say okay maybe but the fact that i believe in it grants it power anyway but i don't really think that's what the movie is doing i uh, and if it if it is it doesn't state it clearly absolutely right because i I think i think that you could say like if you want to try to think like what is what is neo actually thinking during all these scenes where he goes off to his room by himself it could just be very simply like and they could have shown this and i think that's your point is he could just be like well it doesn't actually matter whether whether the prophecy is like a lie because it's not actually going to change my decisions i'm still right. going to choose to do my best to try to save my loved ones which is what he proceeds to do uh re- regardless of whether or not he's part of a prophecy or not and that's that's cool, actually, but that isn't communicated on any level um, by the actual film. Right, right. And well, the thing, <laughs> the second movie has Neo choose to save the woman he loves instead of save the world. It gives him that choice and says, you can save humanity or you can save Trinity. And he chooses Trinity. This movie basically presents that same choice to him again. Um, and then kind of takes away Trinity from him. Like, like she, by, I guess, I guess you could argue by allowing her to go with him. He basically like made the reverse choice as he, he chose to save humanity versus save the woman he loves. And if that's true, the, the change in him that caused that choice to be made was not dramatized at all. Yeah, well, almost nothing is traumatized when it comes to Neo's character, and that's one of the other major problems. Yeah, um, yeah. is you know Keanu Reeves is not a not an awful actor, but it's it's just he's not given any opportunity to I, communicate what's happening with him. And we talked a lot about Keanu in the first movie, and and we talked about the bad rap he's gotten as an actor. And I think when you f- zoom in on this movie in particular, I kind of can understand where that bad rap came from because he's just 
he's just nothing in this. He's just yeah. like this, this quiet, um, like c- completely emotionless guy. Like even his conversation with the Oracle where he's basically like demanding, she explain why she didn't stuff. Didn't, didn't tell him stuff. He's just, he's just kind of like, I don't know if the, the direction here was like, Oh, you're supposed to be like the Jesus figure. So like be always like composed and, uh, and, and like regal a little bit or something. But, the the character he was in the first movie is gone. Right. Yeah. He he was capable of getting freaked out in the first movie. Yeah. He, he was this kind of um, um, sarcastic hacker, uh, the guy who flipped off Agent Smith, the, the, the guy who who stumbled around in a in a in a cubicle farm and and vomited when he was told that he was in the Matrix and now it's just yeah just just like it's too too cool you yeah, know it's and that's just, not, i i need i need to think that, that's the problem the other the, the previous movie had too was like everything is too cool everything is so so and this is maybe a tangent or or but there's an opportunity i guess to talk about why something worked so well in the first movie sure. i think because everyone is so cool in the first movie you know that they when they they come into the matrix um, in their um, in their regalia, mm-hmm. they they look completely badass. They look completely different than they did in the real world. You get the awesome like music, and they're like walking outside in slow motion. And everything's everything is highlighting how cool they are. Then they're betrayed. Well, okay, f- f- first they're betrayed when the agents corner them and kill the kid. And everyone's like scared and running and getting all like dusty and dirty, trying to escape. And and Morpheus is just like completely uh, made to not like look not cool anymore. He he's bleeding. He's he's dirty. He's just his gets his ass beat. Everybody else is all is all dusty and unkempt, and then like dies in a pile on the floor. Right. So I'm the point is it takes them, shows them being cool, and then rips that away from them making the coolness like a, a an accent on on the on the horror of what's been done to them right so the mm-hmm. coolness isn't just like in a vacuum of like aren't they badasses it's like it's like a way to underline what what a bad situation they're in but in this movie and in and in revolution or in reloaded and revolutions they're just perfectly cool all the time they never they never have that mo- that that moment where one of them with their sunglasses off says not like this and is then murdered summarily, right? Like everyone is just permanently too cool all the time. Yeah. That's, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, I think that really comes like that comes into focus for me when I look at the one matrixy action scene that's in this movie, which is the beginning when they're going to confront the Merovingian again, and then they mm-hmm. fight the, the vampires that, the, uh, that are upside down mm-hmm. and like, this should be a really great action scene. Like it should be, it's, it's everything that people love about the matrix. It's we're running on walls again. Um, there's columns exploding again. It almost kind of seems intentionally constructed to remind you of the, the first floor office scene from the end Mm -hmm. of the first movie. Yeah. But I think that's the problem. It like, it's trying so hard to recapture that coolness that it just, it seems tired at this point. It's like, Oh, we're, we're going to do this again. We're going to do like they're, they're going to do flippies and she's going to jump off the wall again in the same way. And it's just like like you can't construct something different. Like we have to just just hit these beats again. Like say what you will about the um, the highway scene. At least it was doing something very different than the first movie. Yeah, exactly. And, and that movie, uh, at least, you know, someone gets injured in that one, right? <laughs> I mean, right. As long as they're in the matrix, everything is just perfect and and clean. And they just win. They just win. I mean, even even the confrontation with the Merovingian where they see him again, this guy's in the movie again for a reason. I still don't understand because they need to get Neo back from limbo, which again, I don't get why all this is happening. What it has to do with anything, but they just win. They just like, they're surrounded Mm -hmm. by bad guys surrounded and they just win. Yeah. Right. And then and then the scene's over. It's like we won. The end. Yeah, right. It's uh 
Yeah. I will say that I thought the movie was going to send them on another quest again, like to get the Oracle's eyes. And I was like, don't do this movie. <laughs> I don't want them to go on another fetch quest for this French guy. And then thankfully, Trinity just said, screw this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's that, that's one of those moments where even though I don't think the scene works, at least that's a flicker of the Trinity that we that we know from the first movie. Yeah. Um, which, which was absent for an entire movie. Um, I, yeah. And I, I like this Trinity. I like her yeah. a lot. I like, like I think I think the, the character of Trinity um, is a very different kind of, you know, female action star than is the most typical like badass woman female action star. Right. I think she's closer actually to um, what was the name of the character from Bound? Uh, Corky. Yeah, Corky. Yeah, she's closer to that kind of kind of woman. And I I, I, I think she's fascinating. And I think the, the Wachowskis love exploring these kind of female characters. Um, but but again, I, a, after that, I don't know if the, the movie knows what to do with her. Like yeah, she's I mean, just kind of you just have to be the sacrificial lamb. Right. Isn't that called fridging these yeah, days? Yeah. Where you, you just you just kill the love interest to make the situation sadder. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was disappointing. It's I, I, I don't know why, but I keep feeling compelled to talk about the source. Because we'll, Yeah, go ahead. Let's try to explain or, or the, understand. The, the right. Because because the, the idea of the source is mentioned like two times. You know, it, it's barely barely referred to in in the in the uh, maybe three times yeah um and apparently it's like the entire key to how the mythology of the movie works like or, or the, the whole series really like there's this the source we don't really know what it is other than that it has the word source which is kind of like source code so you're like okay so this is something to do with like the machine world and everything comes from like all, all the machine intelligences come from the source and it is is sort of like a religiously powerful thing in the sense that like Neo has to return his code to the source and it's like glowing white and gold and and clearly has like a religious symbolism to it. Um, and like uh, Agent Smith is let, like won't return to the source. Right. And right. Th that's the whole thing there. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, the, the prophecy was that he would return to the source and free them from the matrix like that was the the prophecy he was told and then we learn that actually no it's he's returning to the source and that's gonna um that's gonna you know reinsert his code which will balance the equation and reset the matrix whatever i don't know i don't know what balance the equation actually means and i don't know why he has code since he's a person no he's a program man he's a he's a man code he, he's a but but why would he have code i because is the one <laughs> okay, I mean I get I mean I I mean you're right like that's that, that's what the movie's trying to say but yeah um I guess you just have to accept that yeah but, but none of this is conveyed adequately to let you understand what's happening is is what I'm trying to yeah I mean I say. mean if we if we get down to the end of the movie like why they win in the end I still don't really understand why N Neo allowing himself to be smithed is what wins the day. And, and I, I, I thought about this for a while and I watched a YouTube video that, that made the argument that actually the one is Smith, that, that Neo is not the one. And they had a whole bunch of reasons and I'm not going to go through some of them are weaker than others, but, but basically the idea that, um, when Neo jumped inside Smith and did that weird thing, he basically copied part of himself over into him. And, and that's, kind of directly what the Oracle says to him, that he is you. He is a reflection of yourself. He is the, ver I guess the version of Neo that, that took the blue pill instead of the red pill, whatever. Uh -huh. Um, and, and therefore because he's part of Neo, presumably he has that same code. And the only way to, to truly return the code to the source is for both of them to go to it. And Smith refuses to do that. It's so the only way to make him do it is for having have him take over someone who's jacked directly into the source. And this is all, you know, supposition because the movie doesn't actually say any of this in any kind of way, like expository or visually at all. Yeah. And also it treats computer code like some kind of fluid or it's, it's, I, I think, I think you said earlier, like why, why couldn't they just use any of the millions of other humans they have jacked into the source <laughs> right. to 
to do a similar thing. I mean, yeah, I, I like and, and exactly as you say, you can say like, okay, well, Smith does say that part of his code was copied over onto Smith and maybe something to do with that. But right. It, but I, I don't think this is like nitpicking though. It's like you, I, I have to understand the basics of what's happening in the movie to, to care about it. Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think this movie doesn't work on the 500 foot level. So you have to try to dive into it to figure out what's going on. Um, and, and so so if if the things were if the metaphors were clear and therefore the detail behind the metaphor didn't matter because I understood what it was trying to visualize and trying to say, that's something different. But because the metaphor is not clear to me, because whether the movie's being intentionally ambiguous or whether it's just not a very well written script it forces you to kind of dive into it to try to see if you can unlock something. And the further you dive into this world, the less sense the world makes. I think one of the reasons why it's frustrating and why it like prompts this level of conversation is that you, you just know that they could have made this awesome. Um, yeah. With like, like the, the raw materials they have here are, are, often fairly interesting and I feel like I have the confidence in them that they probably would have cut the fat out uh, the, the parts that didn't work didn't make sense or, or weren't actually impactful if they'd had time um because because like I mean as we've said the whole Zion part works really well so maybe they just needed to fix the the matrix part yeah um the, the zion part almost feels like a completely, completely different like like movie idea of, of like okay uh machine army versus our yeah. a- anime subterranean mech um i mean they basically just wanted to make like a mech movie and, and we're like all right well we'll shoehorn this in here the zion um, part reminds me so much of jupiter ascending which is a movie we're gonna get to in months but uh-huh. um it, it feels similar to that it's it's very sci-fi tech like big fights like that um yeah yeah i i don't know i don't know like i'm not even sure what else to say about this movie at this point it like the thing that frustrates me so much is i rewatched the matrix and i fell in love with that movie all over again like i fell in love with the filmmaking i think the sisters did a fantastic job with that movie from part one from part a to part z like everything about that movie works the script is tight the action's great the directing is on point they invented all these new things it's such a tight story that's so well told and and this these movies especially this last one just it's just not there it's just and and there's part like i can see i can see the wachowskis in in this movie like i can still see them in here there's parts of it like you see how this movie explores identity and personality and and who these people are and 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 what it means to be a human in this world you can see those things being explored but just not to the level of i've expected like not to the level of bound this this wonderfully small but fascinating film exploring identity exploring who you are it's just not it's just not there here yeah i think um it it doesn't come together like that's the thing is there's not there's not nothing here you know there's there's entertaining scenes there's there's interesting character things like i'm always i've always been really taken by the whole um bit where bane uh where smith gets into bane and 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 kills the woman on the ship and he's being oh, all yeah. creepy and and that's so good and that's love, such a good damn good hugo weaving impression it's so yeah, good yeah i love that whole thing I, I genuinely think that whole part is great i'm not like like not even not even like great for this piece of crap movie it's like like no i i, I love that um i i borderline love the zion bit although i think it could have been tightened up quite a bit um I, I I love a lot of the uh, the Agent Smith scenes. Um, there's a lot not to love, and there's a lot that makes no sense. Yeah, and yeah. it doesn't come together. Yeah, and it's I, like you said, it's just disappointing. I mean, that's what I yeah. feel like. It's just like I know they could have done better. Um, and and yeah, you wonder what the story behind this thing. I tried to like dive into this and see if I could research like what the sisters think about these two movies. You know, twenty years later, however long it's been. Um, and I couldn't really find anything, but I, I really, I really would be fascinated to like sit them down and interview and like, talk to me about the matrix sequels, talk to me about these movies. 
talk to me about how you feel about them now that you're so far removed from them. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I want to understand what what they were trying to do more more precisely. And and as you say, do they feel like they failed, or do they think that these are yeah. good? Because um, I don't. I think either answer would be interesting, honestly. Because if they're like, nope, that these yeah. movies said exactly what we wanted them to say, then I'd be like, huh, <laughs> okay, yeah. And well. you know, there, there's a lot of people out there, um, and some of them are going to be listening to the show that that say that. You know, they made Bound, which was a great movie. They made Matrix, was a, which was a masterpiece. And then that's really the only good thing they've done since then. And I, I don't think that's correct. I think we're going to get to some movies that I love to death. Um, different weird movies that, that in some ways don't work as well. Um, I, I think The Matrix is probably going to end up still as probably the best of their movies. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are these are just like blips on what I think is a, an otherwise great career. Yeah. And I think we know, we know why, and it's, it, it has been fun. Like, I'm really glad we did do this yeah. because, um, while, you know, we didn't determine like, Oh, these are actually masterpieces. Um, I, I did find a, a lot of things and was reminded of a lot of things that were, that were either great or at least interesting, um, and, and worth, worth revisiting. Uh, yeah. 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 And if we, um, I mean, I guess the thing we should conclude on here is I kind of want to extend the metaphor that we've been talking about throughout all these movies, which is the matrix trilogy as a transgender metaphor. Um, I think this movie is hardest to see through that lens because I think the movie has so many problems that don't really add up, but if you squint at it, you can see, um, agent Smith as the representative of, um, you know, the, the anti-trans representative that wants everything to be ordered and mm -hmm. normalized yeah. and is literally transforming everyone into himself. He's, he's a ver like, I think, I think one of the, the articles I read, and I'm not sure if I, I agree with this, but, um, one of the articles I read called Smith, a, a trans woman who has like chosen, um, to ignore that side of her and reject it. And so lashing out about everyone else and conforming to this, this idea. I'm not sure if I see that extension of it. I like it better as him just representative of, uh, society's need to homogenize mm -hmm. and, and destroy anything that's different and make it all the same. Um, and I think the, the child Sati kind of falls into that. She's this person who, um, was different, was without purpose in the system and therefore was going to be destroyed because it wasn't necessary. And so you can look at it as, as Neo sacrificing himself to create a world in which, uh, these different people are, uh, are able to survive and live. Um, and, and so I think that's a, a nice cap on the metaphor, but I just think like, if you look at like, we've talked about this less and less as we've gone through the movies, because I still think like the first one is very clearly like textually to me, like a, a trans metaphor. And these two are just like, you kind of have to reach and squint to pull it together. It's there, but like the movies themselves, it's much less focused. Yeah, that, that I mean, that's interesting, and and I I do I do see it now that you kind of sketch it out like that. But that's that's like if if I have like one of those Jackson Pollock paintings, <laughs> and I'm like pointing over here at the corner, like the very like bottom corner, and I'm like this line of paint here, the way it crosses this one, that's supposed to symbolize this thing, and you're like, yeah, I don't, there's no way yeah. I'm going to notice that, like, it yeah. doesn't connect. I mean, the only thing that makes me really feel it to be so is. The, ch the the film chooses to end not on the celebration of freedom in Zion, not on um, Neo, you know, he made the sacrifice and like we don't we don't end on him dying in his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. We end on this girl. We end on Sati and we end on this sunrise over the Matrix like it's been rebooted. It's this new place where, um, you know, people like Sati who could be seen as a, a, a child who is a, a trans woman or trans man, I'm not sure, um, is, is getting to live their life in, in the way they want it to. So I think, you know, the, choosing to end on this kid a, a, of their trilogy seems intentional. Like this is this is the thing they wanted to leave the movie with. Yeah, right. And And I think even, you know, previous conversations, we talked about how uh, the, the trans metaphor 
is is obviously there and, and, and it's clearly there but also you can expand it out to being just a metaphor for people who feel uh, like they don't have a role in society yeah. just any kind of marginalized people yeah. any kind of marginalized people and 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 sati certainly qualifies as that absolutely yeah so. yeah i mean that, i think that's the great thing about metaphors like that is if when they're well constructed they work in the intended way um but can be also you know applied to many other different interpretations and yeah i i originally thought that this one was one that worked that way and and it does still here at the end i just don't think as well like whenever you talk about the matrix as a as trans metaphor you're really really only talking about the first movie like i think you can you can tie the other ones into it but I, that's the one where it feels like the wachowskis are saying something here and this is what they're saying even if they were doing it subconsciously um this is what they're saying right yeah um but that's the thing is that only that metaphor only really crops up in a couple of of places. It's not like that's right. the overriding theme of the entire story for that, yeah. for this movie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So that is the end of the matrix. Um, I think we made the decision. We're not going to do the animatrix, Matt. I, I kind of, I kind of just want to be done with the matrix now. <laughs> like I, 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 like, I just don't, I just don't want to explore this world anymore. I think one of the things I said to you earlier today was the reason why the first movie works so well is because the world is painted in broad, you know, not very clear strokes. And the more we learn about this world, the less interesting it is. So I don't want to be in it anymore. Yeah. I've seen the animatrix before. I have um, too. Yeah. And, and, and also like we want to study, these women as filmmakers and they were somewhat involved in the animatrix, but, um, I don't think they, uh, I don't think they had the level of control over it that, that looking into that would really teach us that much yeah. about what they're doing. Which so. is also why the next film on, on their filmography is V for Vendetta, but they did not direct that film. They just wrote mm -hmm. the script. So that is also why we are not going to be covering that movie. Maybe we'll circle back around to that at the end and do it as like a bonus thing. Um, but we're going to really stick to the movies that they've directed, um, that the films that they've made as filmmakers, because um, I think this series was originally called Deconstructing Director. So we should mm -hmm. really hold true to that, um, which means that the next film of the Wachowskis we're going to be covering is Speed Racer. Oh, yeah. Um, I can't wait. We've done a whole Kryptonian collection about this before. I'm going to have to listen to that episode before we record this to make sure I'm not just repeating myself the whole time. <laughs> but I'm probably going to be repeating myself a lot of times. This is out of all the movies that we've done and um, we're going to do on this list. This is the one I've seen the most and the one I'm most excited about. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. So I can't wait to talk to you about Speed Racer. I can't wait to dive into this through the lens of of what we've learned so far. Me too, honestly. Uh, I, I think when we had that conversation uh, for the previous podcast, I'd watched that movie like once and it was just for that podcast. Mm -hmm. I've watched it several times since then and come to appreciate it even more. Oh, so thank that'll God. be fun. Yeah, love it. Love it. So that's Speed Racer. Um, we're not sure exactly when we're going to do that. We don't like to do these every week because you just get inundated with with the Wachowski. So we'll, we'll slot it in sometime in the future, hopefully within the next month or so. Um, but that's, that's what's next for speed for the Wachowski's speed yeah. racer. See that movie. If you hadn't, I think it's on Netflix. It was on Netflix before yeah. they might've taken it off. It was as of like last week. Cause yeah. I was watching with my kids. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I bet they loved it. It's a great they, movie for kids. Th they do. Although it really emphasizes to you the degree to which the like skipping around in time toward the beginning is disorienting to a four-year-old. <laughs> that, uh, that I can understand. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we go, I wanted to talk about something with you real quick uh, that we that I've been watching. I wanted to talk about the new Amazon original, Amazon Prime original show called Homecoming. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because, like I said at the, the top of the episode, this is a adaptation of a audio narrative podcast that I listened to. Oh gosh. Was it three years ago now? Um, yeah, I think it was three years ago. Wow. Time is, time is going by fast. <laughs> and I think this is like really one of the first of these things I've seen, um, that someone takes an audio narrative and, um, you know, adapts it. Um, this is, Adapted by Sam Esmail, who 
you'll remember Matt was the creator of uh, I, Mr. Robot, Mr. Yep. Robot. Um, so it has it has like a stylistically similar type of tone to it. Um, the 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 plot of the of both of them is about uh, an organization called Homecoming, which is supposed to uh, help soldiers coming back from war, like to help with their PSD, PTSD and like reintroduce them to society and like help like help them. But there's shady stuff going on underneath it all. Um, the main character is um, in, in the show is played by um, Julia Roberts. Interesting. Which is the first, I think this is the first TV show, Julie, TV thing Julia Roberts has done. So it's like, yeah, yeah, it is. It's wow. the first time Julia Roberts has done TV. So this is a big deal. The, I mean, the, the cast is stacked. It has uh, Bobby Cannavale. Um, it has Shea Wingham. It has Sissy Spacek in it. Like the, the, a lot of people turned out for this thing. And a lot of people turned out for the podcast as well because Catherine Keener was the main character in that. Um, the main soldier that it's following throughout this was played by um, Oscar Isaac in the podcast. And it, it, it's a really, I loved the audio story. And I'm about five episodes into the 10 episodes of the television show. And it, it's doing this thing where it's, it's being very faithful to the podcast, which means a lot of um, what happens in this show is just two people in a room talking or a person talking to a person on the phone because the, the source material is an audio narrative. So it's just people talking like that's, that's really all it is. And it's being, it's being faithful to that while still, um, finding a way to do things in a visual medium that makes it work. Um, like for example, there's a scene in the first episode where Julia Roberts is on the phone with her boss and in the, in the podcast, I mean, that was just a, a phone conversation. And in this, she's like on the phone with him while walking from her office through the facility and out the front door to her car. So it like uses this conversation as a way of showing us what the homecoming facility looks like. We get to see what all the different parts of it. We get to see how it's just being stood up and like it's in a building where no one else is in except for this one company. And it adds to the mystery of it. Um, it's, it's doing a lot of very creative things that I was curious about when I heard that they were making this podcast into a show like are you gonna have to change it totally to make it work and they're not really they're just like saying okay how can we visually enhance this conversation that's awesome that that actually makes me happy because um why break something that is, already works really well <laughs> right right I, I I completely agree and I think it like I, I'm kind of glad I watched Mr. Robot before this because I can see you know how this is a Sam Esmail show. I can see how he composites shots, like how he how he lights these things. Like it has a very similar like lighting feel to it. Um, and, and of course, Mr. Robot is a lot of people talking too, right? Like the the therapy sessions in Mr. Robot remind me a lot of some of the the conversational scenes in this. Um, I don't want to say much more of it because I don't want to, to spoil the show at all for anyone. But um, it's all on Amazon Prime, all ten episodes. I'm gonna finish it up. And uh, and hopefully have more to say about it after I do. But um, really, I was really into the, the the podcast. It's one of the first audio narratives I listened to, and I'm glad someone else was too because this thing exists. Julia Roberts is great, of course. Cool. There's no yeah. there's no Oscar Isaac in the show, but uh, the guy they had to play uh, Sergeant Cruz, the main um, soldier character, is is very good as well. Sounds awesome. I mean, I, I think I might try out the the podcast since I don't really have a lot of time to watch TV. Yeah, I, um, I really recommend it for sure. Everyone awesome. should. We'll we'll put a link to the podcast in uh in the show notes this week so everyone can check that out. It's not cool. like I think they're twenty five to thirty minute episodes each in the po in podcast form, so it's not like a huge time commitment. I think there's ten of them, just like there is in the show, and I think that the show is the show is like it's a half an hour show as mm -hmm. well, so it's not. A lot like it's not like they're stretching the story out to make it into a TV show. They're willing to tell it. It seems like they're willing to tell it and then and then get out. So awesome. Yeah. So that's Homecoming uh, available now on Amazon Prime and via podcast. There's actually two seasons of the podcast. Um, I didn't like the second as much as the first, but it was still interesting. But um, cool. I think that's all I had to say about yeah. that. Great. I, and I'll check that out. Yeah. Uh, cool. So that is all we had for you guys this week. If you have any opinions on the Matrix Revolutions or on 
Homecoming or on. Uh, do you guys listen to any other narrative podcasts? Those are becoming more and more popular these days, um, and I really enjoy them. I've listened to four or five of them, and I think they're a lot of fun. So if you like them, too, and you have any you want to recommend to us or to anyone out there, let us know. Reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail dot com or over on Twitter at Doof Media. We'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely love to hear if there's any any other good ones I should know about. And uh, if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. You can find this and all the other shows we do over at doofmedia.com. And if you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford to help ensure we keep growing and keep making new content. We've got a new Patreon goal listed out there for you guys. So if you haven't seen that yet, head on over to the website and check it out and uh, th- maybe throw a buck our way. Yeah. And uh, also, please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Every review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content we make here. All right. We will see you all next week where we will be talking about, um, I can't remember, this is a co- ma- ma- magic of Madoke. It's anime. We're, yeah, we're going to be, an, we're going to be reviewing an anime. It's an anime. Yay. Yay. <laughs> see you next week. And you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.